Hello everyone and welcome back to Jordan Has No Life. My name is Jordan and as you probably could have guessed, I have no life because I am making this video on July 4th instead of hanging out with my friends so I gotta go do that after I bust this one out. Anyways, thinking of renaming the channel to Clickbaiters Incorporated simply because the majority of this video is going to be spent covering Cassandra, not MongoDB, which takes about 30 seconds to explain. So let's go ahead and knock that out and get started. All right, so as promised, I mentioned that we were gonna talk about MongoDB first. So let's go ahead and do that. So MongoDB is one of those databases that I think in, you know, kind of an actual like pragmatic scenario is pretty easy to use. It's well documented. It's got a lot of nice features that make it good as a developer, but at least from like a systems design interview perspective, it's nothing that crazy. And so that's why we can go through it pretty quickly. Mongo typically uses a B tree index. It uses acid transactions if you want them. And typically you would use it with single leader replication and that would just be sharded in order to get better write throughput. And so all of this stuff is pretty, pretty similar to your typical SQL database. Now, obviously, I shouldn't say obviously, but in reality, a lot of these features are configurable so you can kind of plug and play them as you want. But the point is, I think this is probably generally how people are using MongoDB. Even still, the biggest difference between MongoDB and a SQL database, which is why MongoDB gets the title of a NoSQL database, is that MongoDB is document oriented. So what is a document? Well, it's effectively just a nice deeply nested JSON structure of data that you can store in your database. And what that allows you to do is have a little bit more flexibility in terms of what you're actually storing. So for example, if we wanted to store like a person object, here would be the idea of it. And then we could have a nice little JSON document of a name and a length. God knows of what, but that guy Jordan has a long length. So again, that offers us some flexibility beyond the traditional rigid SQL relational table model where everything has to have the same exact columns. So that's pretty much MongoDB. We'll talk about how it compares to Cassandra, but in order to do so, we have to actually talk about Cassandra itself. So Cassandra uses something known as the wide column data model. So instead of being a nested structure, really the only requirements in Cassandra for your data is that you have these two fields right here, and frankly, really only a cluster key. The sort key is optional. But basically, we've got a cluster key, we've got a sort key, and then pretty much everything else in every single row is optional. And you can either have them there or you don't have to. It's really not too big of a deal. So let's go ahead and keep talking about this. First, we're gonna start by talking about partitioning in Cassandra. So if you recall, we've got a cluster key and a sort key, and that is going to do things for us in partitioning. What it basically means is that we are going to decide how we're partitioning each row based on the value of its clustering key. And so that configuration for partitioning is actually going to be shared via gossip protocol. So every single node can go ahead and just like gossip. If you recall from our consistent hashing video, this would be like our hash ring. And this is gonna say which keys are going on which node. So in this case, all the keys in this range are, let's say on this node over here. And so just in general, our hash ring is going to tell us which nodes go, or rather which rows go where, and each node is going to share that with one another via a gossip protocol. If a node were to go down, these guys would both start gossiping that to one another and eventually everyone would agree on the partitioning state of the whole system. And then of course, I did even forget to write this, but we've got a local index with a sort key. So within each partition, the rows are sorted based on the value of this guy here, a sort key. And keep in mind, the reason I call that a local index is because they're only sorted within that single partition. If we're looking at a different partition, then the sort key is pretty much irrelevant across them. So in Cassandra, it's actually a very, innate, a very opinionated system about how they want reads and writes to go. And typically, it is very strongly recommended that all reads and writes go to just one partition. There is very little support for distributed transactions. If you're running Cassandra, you don't wanna be running two-phase commit. Ideally, all of your reads are coming from one partition at a time, and all of your writes are going to one partition at a time. So that's very important to keep in mind. Now, let's go ahead and talk about replication because replication is probably what makes Cassandra the most unique out of all the systems that we've discussed so far. So first off, we're actually using leaderless replication. So this is the first time we're discussing a database that is kind of generally used in this type of fashion. And if you recall, what that means is that uh, you can do things like have quorums. So you would write to and read from a majority of nodes. 
And although this doesn't technically achieve strong consistency, it does mean that generally speaking, when you write and then you read using a quorum node right after that, you should be able to see that written value in at least one of the nodes. Of course, that is configurable though. If you don't want to have to use quorums, you can say writes can only go to a single node, reads can only come from a single node, and that's really all just depending on how comfortable you are with eventual consistency and staleness of data. In order to make sure that there is less stale data on each node, Cassandra will do things like read repair and anti-entropy. So read repair, if you recall, is basically saying like, oh shoot, you know, this guy doesn't have the value from our original write over here. So once this client sees the value, he's going to write back to this database and read repair it. Anti-entropy, on the other hand, would be the occasional sending of data via a Merkle tree from one database to the next in order to make sure that they have consistent states. Using a Merkle tree allows sending lesser data over the network because you only compare the differences in data between the two tables. Then, in addition, of course, whenever we use leaderless replication, anything other than single replication opens us up to write conflicts. And when we have write conflicts, how do we resolve them? In particular, Cassandra chooses to use last write wins, or LWW. So obviously, there are some problems with this, namely that we can't trust timestamps in distributed systems. There's clock drift, there's network lag, all of this other stuff. And so as a result, we can have lost writes. If I write at the same time as you and my write happens to just barely have an earlier timestamp, mine is effectively just gone from the system and I'm gonna have no clue what happened. So keep in mind that when you're using Cassandra, technically you don't have great data integrity. Additionally, uh, an another alternative to Cassandra, which is basically the same exact thing, is called RIAC. This is another type of database system. However, the one main difference between RIAC and Cassandra is that as opposed to using last write wins, RIAC gives us the option to use CRDTs or conflict-free replicated data types in order to help us resolve our write conflicts. And I have a video dedicated to those that I made, I don't know, a month or two ago. Okay, so now let's look at just a single database node in Cassandra because we've talked about the partitioning and the replication, but at least within a single node, Cassandra does some nice stuff in order to help performance, which is that it uses an LSM tree and SS tables in contrast to a B tree. So what does this actually help us do? Well, it's a little bit better for writes because this guy right here, aka the LSM tree, is in memory. And that means that all writes are first going to memory before they have to go to disk, when they're eventually flushed to an SS table. This is in contrast to a B tree where your write originally goes to disk and as a result, writes are a bit slower, but reads are a little bit faster on B trees. So keep that difference in mind as well. Another thing is that Cassandra does not really fully support ACID transactions. It really only likes row level locking so that, you know, you're, within a row, your value is definitely going to be correct. But if you wanted to do something like a read, modify, update transaction on multiple rows, you might have trouble doing something like that. Or at least Cassandra wasn't originally made with that intention. Ideally, most of the writes that you should be doing should just be going to one row at a time. And that is the best way to really use Cassandra. So let's do a quick conclusion so that I can go meet up with some friends and stop being such a nerd. Basically, MongoDB is really, really good for when you need the data integrity of a relational database type of system. If you want ACID transactions, if you want to be able to run two-phase commit in order to perform distributed transactions, then MongoDB does support all of that. Obviously, the, the speed is going to be more comparable to something like a SQL database. However, it's really, really nice to be able to have the data flexibility that you do by using this document-oriented data model. On the other hand, Cassandra is extremely different than that. It's got like a very opinionated type of way of using it, where basically you want to always be reading from and writing to one partition at a time. In terms of reads, those reads can read multiple rows at a time, but ideally for writes, you're probably writing one row at a time as well. But at the same time, as a result of this, you don't have great data guarantees. Due to things like write conflicts, you can just have writes getting clobbered or removed. And due to the lack of ACID transactions and distributed transactions, if you plan on doing things like that, you should be very, very careful. And you might even have bugs in your code if you're trying to code them up on your own. So a good case for Cassandra in general, because I think it's good to kind of outline one of these, would be something like a chat application like Facebook Messenger. The reason being that you're often bottlenecked by writes there because everyone's going to be writing so many messages. All of the reads that you do are probably going to be for one chat at a time and they're always going to be ordered by timestamp. And so something like using chat ID as the cluster key for partitioning so that all of your messages are on the same partition could be really, really useful. 
And then of course, to make that index read faster, we can basically just sort by timestamp. And again, this is going to be the generalized case which we would be reading those messages. It's gonna be very rare that we would ever have to write to two partitions at once because it's never like you're sending a chat to, or you're never sending a message to multiple chats at once. But at the same time, you're probably always just going to be writing one message at a time and it's always going to be going to one chat at a time. So this is a really, really good use case. Anyways, guys, I hope this video was useful. As you can see, there are some pretty distinctive use cases between Cassandra and MongoDB, and it's very important to understand this difference because in an actual interview, when someone says, do you want to use a SQL table or a NoSQL table, and then you say NoSQL, and they say which one, you better know which one. So have a good one, guys, and I will see you in the next one.